Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Gabhart. A lot of you already know me because a lot of you are in my class. If you're in my class and you want to make sure that I know you're here, I've got a sheet back there uh, next to the pizza where you should sign in so that you can get attendance and bonus. There's also a sign-in sheet for anybody who's in Dr. Calvin's class. I think she's offering bonus, but I'm not trying to speak for her. I'm not really sure, uh, but that's her class. And also, if you got pizza, can you be sure to sign the sheet that the library has? so that they can show which students got pizza. They don't really care which students, they care how many students. So yeah, if you can be sure to sign that if you haven't already. So there's three sign-in sheets back there. Anyway, hi, Liz Gabbard here. Welcome to Igniting Hope, Solutions for the Drug Crisis. I'm so excited y'all are here. I've been looking forward to this for a while. I am just here to introduce Angela Mallett all the way from Mississippi. She's the Director of Outreach for End It For Good. And I'm gonna to read to you her biography here so you can get an idea of who she is. Wherever she goes, Angela is looking for ways to make the system around her better. Let me see if I can pull this out. There we go, that's better. That instinct served her well as she began designing and managing bridge construction projects after earning her civil engineering degree from the University of Mississippi. Several years later, her world was shaken to the core after a traumatic medical experience led to opioid use disorder. That began a five-year stint of firsthand experiences with the impact of addiction and the criminal justice system's response to it. Angela is now a graduate of the 20th Judicial Drug Court and in long-term recovery. Her professional focus has shifted to advocating for systemic change in the criminal justice system and the way we treat people with substance abuse disorders. Yes, yes, yes. I love that. She is a subject matter expert for the Opioid Response Network and served as the outreach director for the Governor's Opioid Task Force. Angela also serves as the state leader for the National Recovery Advocacy Project. As the director for outreach at End It For Good, Angela's focus is on fostering diverse community engagement. Love it, y'all, love it. That spans a wide range of initiatives that include community discussions to train law enforcement and first responders on harm reduction, and trauma-informed responses. Her hope is to see everyone treated with dignity regardless of where they are on issues of addiction and drug policy. When she's not at work, Angela can be found exploring the art, food, and culture of her great state of Mississippi and with her daughter Stella. If she's not out on an adventure with Stella, she's probably geeking out on a historical documentary. Love it. Thank you. Please uh, give a warm welcome to Angela Mallet. Hello, hello. Thank you guys for having me here in Texas. Um, I flew over this morning and I'm excited to spend lunch with you guys. So my hope is that I am going to share some new ideas with you guys. I'm gonna tell you some stories and hope I uh, will tug on your heartstrings a little bit, and then I hope to challenge your comfort zone. So at the end of this, we're gonna have time for feedback and Q&A, and I want, I hope that I can create a, a safe enough space to where if you hear some things today that sound like, whoa, what is she talking about? Uh, I want you to tell us that. Like, change is only gonna happen when it comes to our drug laws and our drug policies, when we have some open, honest, conversation. So um, I'd like to start by inviting you all to, to bring, bring your honest opinions this after, or after this presentation. So when we talk about drug policy, I, I just want to acknowledge from the get-go that this is a really, really big issue. And I could stand up here and lecture to you guys for days and weeks and we would not cover all of these topics. Um, so today, we're just going to be scratching the surface of the, the iceberg. Um, so most of us, no matter where you stand on the spectrum, whether you are a person who has been directly impacted by 
incarceration or substance use or a person who works in the criminal justice system, or maybe you're a friend or a sibling to someone who struggled with drug use, you know, no matter where you stand on this issue, you, we can all usually agree that something needs to change. We might not all agree on the what, but we can all say that something is broken with what we're doing right now. So some people want to see change in stigma. Some people want to see change in the system. Some people want to see change in the way that treatment looks like in our country. Our goal at the organization that I work for, End It For Good, our goal is less harm. That is our North Star, and that is what we want to see through all of the policy changes that we talk about. We want to see less harm in communities, less harm in people's lives, less harm with families and children. So when you have a North Star, like less harm, you have to ask a question, well, where's the harm coming from? And that's what we are going to dive into today. So before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about me and how I ended up here. So I grew up on, a, on the Gulf of Mexico on, in Biloxi, Mississippi, in a sleepy little coastal town. Was born and raised there with a, a big family. Um, went, through, went through all 12 years of grade school and then graduated and went to the University of Mississippi. And while I was at Ole Miss, I got a degree in civil engineering, and then I moved back to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. So I graduated college in 2004, and in 2005, we had a little storm blow in to the Gulf of Mexico called Hurricane Katrina. And so I was baptized by fire into my profession. So I was a year out of college, and my specialty was bridge design. And almost every bridge along the Mississippi Gulf Coast was destroyed after Hurricane Katrina. So I spent the next five, six years of my life getting to be part of rebuilding the community that I grew up in. And it was a, a really great experience. So this is some of the projects that I worked on. This is resetting beams on the I-10 bridge that goes through Pascagoula, Mississippi. This is rebuilding Beach Boulevard in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. This is the Biloxi Ocean Springs High Rise Bridge. Um, about 2006, and then this is 2010 when we completed it. So while I had this incredible opportunity at, right after college to dive into meaningful work and rebuild the place that I called home, I had the skills and the knowledge to, to rebuild this community. Um, I did not have the skills, the knowledge, or the capacity to weather the storm that was about to come through my life. So I was 29 years old, and I got pregnant for the first time. And I was really, really excited. I was like, you know what, this is it. I went to college, I did all the things my parents told me I was supposed to do. I got a good job, and I got a house, and I saved the money because I wanted to have a family one day. But unfortunately, that was not the way this story played out. So I was about eight months pregnant, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I knew something was wrong, so I took myself to the hospital, and I was going into labor because the baby had a birth defect in her heart, and she was stillborn. So at eight months into that pregnancy, you know, all these plans and dreams that I had just kind of ended abruptly. And so they had to remove her, and uh, I was, you know, had a cesarean, and they gave me pain medicine afterwards. So I went home with a lot of emotional baggage and a, lo a lot of emotional pain uh, and no coping skills to process any of that. I did not understand anything about grief. I, addiction was just like not even something on my radar. It was not something that I, I thought that I had to be worried about. Um, and so I had a prescription of Oxycontin and I took those pills for the first few days because I did have some pain. But then I continued to take them to numb a whole lot of emotional pain. And what I told myself was, like, I remember telling my mom and my sisters, just get all this baby stuff out of my house and take it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm going to go back to work, and I'm going to act like this didn't happen. 
And that's what I did. So at 30 years old, I turned 30 while I was pregnant. At 30 years old, I did a nosedive into addiction. And it completely consumed me for the next five years of my life. Um, and so that ended up looking like my losing my job and my home and all of my investments and going, being incarcerated uh, first for misdemeanor charges and possession charges. Uh, I was homeless for about a year and a half. And um, then I was arrested for two felony charges and spent quite some time uh, behind bars. So I eventually went to treatment and I have now been in recovery for almost seven years, and this is my daughter, Stella. So the, the happy side to this whole experience is that I'm now a person in long-term recovery. Um, my daughter is seven years old, and I have been in recovery since she was a baby. And um, yeah, and so life is wonderful today. She is the most important gift of my sobriety. So here's some things. That's a, that's a big story all condensed down to about three or four minutes. Um, so I noticed some things on this journey. Because like my mind, I'm an engineer, right? And I was taught when I was in college, I was taught this thing called the scientific method of evaluation. Scientific method is how you look at any problem or any system that you're trying to repair, right? So you've got to break down the system when this is true, whether you're trying to repair a bridge or a carceral system. So this experience for me, like I saw that there's all these broken parts. If you look at, at our prison system, that's the easiest one to pick on, right? We've got mass incarceration. We've got these bloated budgets. We've got recidivism problems. We've got an inequality. In, unequal enforcement of the laws onto communities of color. And then we look at our mental health system. That's a whole other system that's broken. And our treatment system, the way, in, the way that people access treatment and some of the barriers that they encounter when they're trying to get into treatment. So I see all these things and I'm like, you know, something bigger is going on here. Like this is not just about people who are using drugs or, you know, people who are addicts and are they bad people? Or are they not bad people? Like there's something a lot bigger going on. And so I've spent the last five years researching this and trying to understand what are the bigger forces at play. And that's what I want to share with you guys. So when you look at this thing called the war on drugs, everyone's heard of this, right? Raise your hand. You've heard war on drugs? Okay. Well, when we talk about the war on drugs, there are very different kinds of harm that come from the war on drugs. So most of us are taught that drugs are the problem, that all the harm just comes from the substances themselves. And that's not actually true. Yes, there are some harm that comes from illegal substances. But there's far, far greater harm that comes from the criminalization of these substances. And I saw this through my own experiences. Now, by many means and measures, I am a survivor of the war on drugs. The intervention of the justice system in, in my life helped get me back on the path to recovery. But for many, many other people, that is not the case. Like there were women in treatment sitting right beside me whose stories were identical to mine, but they were given, given 15 years sentence to serve or their children were taken away from them. And that was not the case for me. And I saw this, all of these inequalities, and I was like, something's, something's not right about this. So to understand how you arrive at any juncture, you got to take a look backwards and see where you've been. And so when I started looking at the history of our drug policies in the world, but primarily in the United States, I learned that what we're doing now is not what we've always done. So I want to give you guys kind of a, a brief, short version of uh, the history of drugs. So about 5,000 years ago, humans 
figured out that you can ferment lots of things. You can ferment grapes, corn, wheat, any kind of fruit. Uh, drug use and changing our consciousness is not new. We've been doing it for thousands of years in almost every culture on this planet. Some of our most notary not <laughs> figures uh, were known substance users. People like Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson used opium on a daily basis. He even grew his own opium poppies and cultivated them at his estate at Monticello. So if you look at, at the timeline of alcohol and other substances within the human experience, you see that the first record of alcohol fermentation was about 5,000 BC, and this was in China. We know that Alexander the Great and his band of Mary followers were regular opium users, and they actually introduced opium into Persia and then back east into Asia. We know that the native Peruvians on the opposite side of the globe were using coca leaves during their religious ceremonies. Now, in the 1800s is when things start to get interesting. In the 1800s, science gets into the mix and morphine is isolated from the opium poppy in France and then cocaine is isolated from the coca leaf in Germany. And then in the 1860s, we introduce morphine onto the battlefield, which was this revolutionary advancement in warfare technology because now you can address soldiers' pain immediately on the battlefields. It was just a wonderful thing. And this happened during the American Civil War in the 1860s. But after this, something changed. So now, up until this point in time, you guys with me? For thousands of years, humans used alcohol, cannabis, coca leaves, opium poppies. They use them recreationally. They use them for, for spiritual ceremonies. They use them for medicinal purposes. And that's not to say that people didn't have problems. I'm sure some folks drank too much in ancient Rome, right? But when that happened, they were sent home. They were treated by a doctor or treated by, you know, some kind of medical advisor in their community, but they were not criminalized unless they hurt someone else, right? But the use of these substances was not illegal until after the American Civil War. In the 1870s in the United States, you begin to see the opening of inebriate asylums across the country. The first one was opened in New York State, and then they made their way down the East Coast and through the South. In 1914, we see the passage of the Harrison Narcotics Act. The Harrison Narcotics Act is the first piece of legislation that criminalized opium and cocaine. In 1919, our government passed the Volstead Act. This was, during, this was alcohol prohibition, um, and that was a, a complete disaster that I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the presentation. In 1970, we saw cannabis officially outlawed. In 1971, Richard Nixon launches this war on drugs that, as we know it today. During the 80s, when growing, when cocaine use became popular, we began to see harsher penalties enacted for people who were caught in possession of cocaine or crack cocaine. In the 1990s, we now start to see people's professional licenses taken from them. So not only can you be locked up for substance use, now we can strip you of your ability to provide for your family. In the 2000s, we start to see growing popularity in opioid use, and our responses to that, again, were further crackdowns. So in 2013, the FDA cracked down on the number of opioids that could be prescribed to people. So, so now, what's next? It's 2022, and for the last 150 years, we have institutionalized people. We have locked them up. We have banned them. 
And yet we see increasing drug use, increasing addiction rates, and increasing overdose rates. Why is that? Have you guys ever thought about this? So this happens because of, of harms that come along with drug prohibition. So any market in the world, there are, anytime you criminalize a, part, a market for any popular substance, you're going to get some harms that come along with that. So let's take a look at the harms that come when you criminalize the market for a popular substance. So in 1920, when alcohol was outlawed, we saw almost overnight a violent underground market come up and take control of alcohol sales and supplies. So law-abiding businesses who'd once ran breweries and taverns and sold alcohol legally, when alcohol became illegal, they had to shut their doors and Al Capone starts making millions. Because when you make it illegal, the only people who are going to, to work in that market are people who are willing to break the law. We're seeing the exact same thing on our streets today with other illicit substances. So rather than having regulated businesses like doctors and pharmacies who are in control of giving out um, controlled substances, we, that market is ran by gangs and cartels today. So when you criminalize a market for a popular substance, violence comes along with it. So what happens when you actually criminalize the substance itself? So back again, during alcohol prohibition, when alcohol was made illegal, you went from having quality controlled alcohol that's made you know, in, in a quality controlled way where it's not contaminated to now you have bootleg alcohol. So it's made in the woods or in someone's bathtub. You also get a potency increase, and this is because of a little phenomenon called the Iron Law of Prohibition. Has anyone ever heard of this? Yes, yeah, she's shaking her head. So the Iron Law of Prohibition says that anytime you have to smuggle a substance because it's illegal, you get an immediate potency increase. And you can see this phenomenon play out on any given Saturday at an SEC football game where, where alcohol is illegal on, in, on the inside of the stadium. So at football games on college campuses where alcohol is not allowed inside the stadium, the majority of people who are tailgating are drinking beer when they're outside the game. But when it's time to go inside at, cook -all, at kickoff, they're all drinking 45% alcohol by volume. They're drinking hard liquor because the market forced the change. And so when you have to smuggle your alcohol inside the stadium, are you gonna bring in a six pack of beer? Or are you gonna bring in a flask of liquor? Yeah, no? <laughs> okay. So this is called the Iron Law of Prohibition. And that's exactly what's happening in our country today with fentanyl. Because it is far more profitable to smuggle an ounce of fentanyl than it is to bring in a kilo of heroin. This is because of the Iron Law of Prohibition. So you get a substance transfer. You go from having regulated medicines, now you have contaminated street drugs. And the problem with that is that in 2021, we had over 80,000 opioid overdose deaths in our country. And if you break that down, 88% of them contained illicit street fentanyl, which is like so, prod so potent in contaminating our drug supply because of the Iron Law of Prohibition. So if you remember, back on the timeline I showed you guys, in 2013, the FDA began cracking down on the prescribing of, of legal opioids. When they did that, almost immediately you see opioid overdose deaths skyrocket because now we cut people off from safe, medications that are produced in a lab by a pharmaceutical company, now they have to get them from the street where there's contamination and fentanyl and opioid overdoses skyrocketed after this. So when you, when you criminalize a market, you get violence as a byproduct. When you criminalize a substance, you get contamination and a potency increase. So what happens when you criminalize a consumer? 
So we know now, because of our drug laws, that rather than treating people who are using substances as patients needing medical help, we're now treating them as criminals needing punishment. In the state of Texas right now, there are 19,401 nonviolent drug offenders serving less than one year sentences in your state prisons. And that costs the taxpayers of Texas over $118 million just to house these 19,000 individuals who have not committed a violent crime. All right, and we know that I'm not just picking on Texas. Mississippi is actually the number one incarcerator of people in the world. So I'm not, I'm not just picking on Texas. Um, all of us in the South have, um, have this mindset that we should put people in prison um, for some unfortunate reason. But Mississippi and Texas are two of the highest incarcerators in our country, and the United States incarcerates far more people than any other developed country in the world. So the problem with responding with incarceration to a person's drug use is that it creates this vicious cycle, y'all. When you respond to somebody's drug use with incarceration, it creates a disconnection in that person's life. Now they have a criminal record, which is going to make employment really difficult and housing really difficult to find when they get out of incarceration. And all of these things are traumatic experiences. And research has conclusively shown that trauma is one of the ultimate drivers of addiction in the first place. So we've created a system that makes trauma worse for people. We also know that although we have the same laws across our country and across our states, they are unequally enforced onto communities of color. People of color experience, experience the um, harms from the war on drugs at about 12 times the rate of others. We also know that it's really dangerous to respond to a person's drug use with incarceration because they are 12 times more likely to die of an overdose after being released from, from incarceration. So, so what are we gonna do about this? I'm looking at you guys and like you're nodding your head and it seems like this is resonating with you because you read about it, you see it, you probably have friends who have experienced this. So what do we do? Well, we believe that the answer to our drug policy issues and to the overdose crisis that we're seeing in our country right now, the answer is in harm reduction. So can you raise your hand if you guys have heard of harm reduction? Do you know what that means? Okay. So harm reduction, for those of you who have not heard of it, it's not a new idea either. Harm reduction, if you Google it, it will tell you, Google will tell you that the definition of harm reduction is reducing the risk associated with any inherently dangerous activity. Okay, so we do this with our kids when we put life jackets on them before we go out in the water. We do it when we put seat belts on, when we ride in our cars. It's not a new concept. So set drugs down for just a minute. Totally different industry. Let's talk about the, aut the automotive industry for a second. So the first cars that were sold to consumers in the United States were really dangerous contraptions. Like they had kerosene headlights, no blinkers, there was no speedometer, it was just like every man for himself, the wild, wild west. So over the last hundred years, we have implemented harm reduction measures to driving to make it a heck of a lot safer than it used to be. So we have backup cameras now, we have red lights, we have lane sensors, we have seat belts, we have child car seats. All of these are measures to reduce the risks associated with the inherently dangerous activity of driving, right? And data shows that harm reduction in the automobile industry has worked. Motor vehicle fatalities over the last 100 years have continued to decline per capita. We also practice harm reduction with alcohol. So if you guys have 
if you drink alcohol, you've been to a bar, you know you have to be 21 in order to go in. There, are, There's labels on the alcohol. You know what you're buying. You know what's in it. And if you break the law, if you drink and drive, well, then you have to be accountable for that. These are harm reduction measures to reduce the risk associated with the inherently dangerous activity of drinking. So what are some ways to reduce harm from drugs? One place that has done the most progressive harm reduction policies in the world is Portugal. So the country of Portugal, you guys may not know this, but in 2001, they had a heroin addiction rate in their country that was five times that of the United States today. Like over 1% of their population was injecting heroin on a daily basis. And their prime minister was like, our economy cannot sustain this. Like, we, we, we cannot continue this. We have to do something. So Portugal brought together a panel of scientists, economists, addiction experts, justice experts, and they met and they devised a plan and they, they took at that time what was the most radical change of any, anywhere in the world. They decriminalized possession of all drugs. From cannabis to crack, in Portugal, it is no longer a crime to possess any of these substances. So what Portugal did is they addressed this third category of harm, and they went from treating people who use substances as criminals needing punishment back to treating them as patients needing help. And this is the crucial next step because decriminalization will not work if you don't do this. Portugal shifted their drug intervention dollars. So all of their drug intervention dollars in their country, they now spend 90% of it on prevention and treatment, and they only spend 10% of it on enforcement. So what that looks like is, yes, there's some residential treatment. You know, They have on-demand treatment for people who come into a hospital and are needing help but they also created a massive incentive program. So for people who are coming out of incarceration, <coughs> excuse me, incarceration or treatment, they are able to help get them reemployed. So let's say you used to be a hairdresser and for whatever reason you developed a problem with substances and you needed to go to treatment or maybe you were incarcerated and you got out. Um, when you get out of treatment, they will go to an employer or go to a salon and say, if you employ this lady, we'll pay half her wages for a year. So the point is to try to make everyone have opportunities to rebuild a life that they want to be present for. In contrast, in the United States, we do the exact opposite. We spend 90% of our drug intervention dollars on enforcement and incarceration, and we only spend 10% on prevention and treatment. So just imagine for just a second what that would look like if it were just 50-50. You know, if you know some people in your own personal lives who are struggling right now, maybe they could get the help that they need if our resources were shifted differently here. So, Portugal did this in 2001. It's now been 20 years. And did it help? So in the country of Portugal, since 2001, and since they made this policy change, their injection drug use rates are down by 70%. Drug addiction rates are down by 50%. And also drug-related crime across the entire country is also massively down. So again... What Portugal did is they addressed this third category of harm, and that's harms to the consumers by not, not incarcerating them for their substance use. But what I want to know is how do you address these other two categories of harm? Because I am, I am really, really tired of going to funerals for people who've overdosed from fentanyl. And I'd love to see less violence and hear about less violence in Jackson, Mississippi, which is one of the has one of the highest crime rates in the country. So how do you address these other two categories? Anybody have any thoughts? No? 
So we believe that the only way that you're going to address all three categories of harm from our drug policies is through some form of legal regulation. That is the only way that you can bring the market back from the underground, back into a quality controlled environment, and the substances to have regulation and not be contaminated and potent. So what we've learned through our research at End It For Good and the conversations that we've had across the country is that you don't have to swallow this whole pill of the war on drugs. Yes, there's always going to be some harm that comes from substances when people use them, but we do not have to have this whole other category of harm that comes from the criminalization of these substances. We should put all of our resources in addressing the human issues that are causing people to use substances and less focus on criminalizing. So these are some really big ideas I just threw at you. Decriminalization, legal regulation of substances. Policy changes like that are big and they take a long time. So what are some things that we can do right now? Harm reduction measures in your state and in my state in Mississippi look like making sure people have access to medication assisted treatment, making sure they have access to naloxone or Narcan, fentanyl testing strips, clean syringe supply. These these factors will help keep people alive long enough to make sure that they can get the treatment that they need it, that they need. Law enforcement can practice harm reduction by learning about what diversion looks like. Diversion programs are where police officers are allowed to divert people into treatment rather than into further incarceration. Programs like LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, are incredible programs that are starting to spark up across the country um, that allows officers to interrupt this part of the cycle that we were talking about earlier and divert people. Judges can practice harm reduction by pra issuing person-centered person judicial responses. Intervention courts, or also known as drug courts, they're a form of harm reduction also. Social workers, you can practice harm reduction with your clients by meeting them where they are and asking them to take small steps toward their recovery, not expecting them to have one massive leap into abstinence in one day. If you have a friend who's struggling with substance use disorder, you can practice harm reduction with your friend by prioritizing their life and their health rather than saying like, hey, you just have to stop right now. Lawmakers can practice harm reduction by thinking through, is this next bill that I'm about to vote on going to increase harm to people or decrease it? So I want to take a minute and just address the elephant in the room because yeah, I'm talking a lot about harm reduction and decriminalizing and, and not incarcerating people for their drug use. And I just want to say that Nowhere in this conversation are we saying that people should not be accountable, okay? So accountability is, is still really, really important. If you harm someone because of your alcohol use or your drug use, you have to be accountable for that, right? If you drink and drive and you endanger other people, you have to be accountable for that, right? If you commit domestic violence because you're high, you have to be accountable for that. So we're not saying that... It is a, a either or, it is a both and. You have harm reduction from our laws and the responses that we have to people for their drug use, but you also have accountability for the, any harms you commit to others. Harm reduction works because it provides an exit to the cycle. When you respond to a person's drug use with protection, it creates opportunity for stabilization in that person's life. They can access medical care if they need it. They can connect with other services, other people who are willing to help them. And it helps them get on a path to rebuilding their life. Harm reduction works because it connects drug users with other people. You know, we know that 
whether we like it or not, drugs are always going to be with us. Some drugs are going to be a powerful source for both healing and for harm. And we can't unlearn thousands of years of these substances being part of the human experience, nor can we undo some of the damage that we've caused in our society by the policies we've enacted. But what we can do is focus on preserving life for people and understand that humans who are struggling with drug use, it's, they're not just a statistic. They're actual human beings who have been through something that they didn't have this, the capacity to deal with. Harm reduction can give us the roadmap to reform that we're looking for, and that's what we at End It For Good would like to invite all of you to do, to join us on this journey of learning and having these conversations. So thank you for listening, and thank you for being part of this presentation. Um, I would like to invite any of you to ask any questions, give any feedback. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, come on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. And uh, you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars um, that has now become milk. Really hurt us. Give it just a second. Hello? There okay. you go. Um, when we privatized the prison system, mm -hmm. We changed the way laws got made because we live in a world where it's quid pro quo. So if people like American Express and large corporations who have invested in the prison system mm -hmm. make money from the government who's paid to them, they get paid to put people or to house them in prison. And then those same people that are on the board of American Express are also the lawmakers we have a problem. So when you're addressing this issue, you know, of harm, mm -hmm. the harm is starting from the money too. So there's, there's two sides of it. It's, it's who's making it on the back end and it's who's making it on the front end. We had your Pablo Escobar, that's your front end. Right. And then you have the lawmaker who has a big smile on his face and lives in a nice house who's making it on the back end. That's a huge issue right now um, that, that covers all of that. When, when our lawmakers get paid under the table to push laws that hurt us, mm -hmm. that's the harm right there. Um, on the other side of it, I recently read a story on TikTok. TikTok has a completely different algorithm for their people in China, it's a Chinese-based company, than they do for America. So they purposely look at, um, like our country, uh, they push things that disrupt or mindset, whereas in their own country, they only allow their people to see stuff that elevates them mentally. And so those two things, I think, play a huge part in the battle that uh -huh. we're all fighting here um, as someone who's, who's also uh, lived with substance abuse, mm -hmm. you know, and, and can start to see the bigger picture. It's, we're stuck in the middle. We're the sandwich meat. But you have these large amounts of money that are getting exchanged to um, 
to put us in prison, to keep us in prison, to keep us going back for the drugs. And then you have those same people who are invested in companies that want to keep our mindset down and want to keep us low uh, in our mindset so that we stay in that recidivism um, that we go through. And I think that would be really important to add into what we're dealing with here, um, that we all be aware of those things. And, and I think the biggest thing is the core is what we're putting in our minds because that will affect what we're also going to be putting in our bodies. So I, I just want to add that I think those are two really big points to support, you know, what you're, what you're expressing here. And I think that we all should be aware of those as well. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. I agree with you, and I commend you on your recovery also. Um, you know, I have not, we have not included kind of like the... Um, the political incentives that come from lawmakers uh, who are invested in the industrial prison complex. So that's that's a nice thought that I'll take back to our team and see if there's a way that we can incorporate that into our presentation. Thank you. Anyone else have thoughts? Yes. Hey, is this still on? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how people who are addicted need connection with others around them mm -hmm. but very often i've heard from students who have addicts in their families they struggle to actually make that connection with the family member because the family member is pushing them away by doing things like stealing their tv and selling it for drug money or whatever right right so i've had students ask me how am i supposed to make a connection with this family member who's a drug addict i was hoping you could answer that yeah that's a hard question because yeah, it is, because the reality of when you are in the midst of problematic substance use, um, your brain is hijacked, you know, and it is the, the internal drive to acquire that substance so you're not sick or you can escape whatever pain you're struggling with is, I mean, it's, it's like a flight or fight drive, and it just kind of, it takes over. Um, I would suggest to a student who has a family member who's struggling with active addiction, I would suggest setting some hard boundaries. You, know, you have to have boundaries there to protect yourself, but also doing that with love and say, and just say like, I understand that you're struggling right now and I'm willing to help you if you wanna go get help, but here's where my boundaries are and, I, and you can't if, the, if you steal from me well I have to I'm going to report that um, so you know I'm not I don't I never think that we should let people get a buy with crimes that they commit just because they're in the midst of active addiction especially if they're harming others um, you know it's a it's a hard balancing act yeah you're welcome Anyone else? Okay, well, did everyone get pizza and cupcakes? Okay, come on, she's got another question. The questions came to mind. Okay, so I have another question. You talked about how after the Civil War, mm -hmm. there was that rise of treating drugs as a crime rather than an illness. Correct. Why? What happened? Were there so many addicts from the battlefield or? What changed? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> because, um, you know, after the Civil War was the end of slavery. And so, you know, it has been well researched and well shown that many of our first drug laws were born out of, out of racial inequalities, right? And it was another attempt to control communities of color or to punish communities of color. So I would say um, the first asylums that we saw open in the 1870s were inebriate asylums, but they were also mental health asylums. So it was just like kind of this shift of um, if people are not mentally well or they have emotional problems with drugs and alcohol, we're going to just put them away and isolate them from the rest of society. Um, and you know, these institutions began being built and they became profitable. So then more of them were built. 
And, you know, that was kind of like the precursor to, to our prison complex today. There are many threads of, of unequal racial implications of the drug war that go back a long, a long time. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, I hope, okay, you'll finish up. I hope this was informative for you. You can, this is a QR code to follow End It For Good. Um, you can follow us on social media. You can email me anytime um, or reach out to our team. Um, our founder, Christina Dent, did a TED Talk with the same information in it. If you'd like to share it or if this is interesting to you, if you have a friend, a brother or sister who you think might be interested, shoot them a TED Talk and um, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you all. All right, I just wanted to say really quickly, um, in reference to my first question, I hope it didn't come across like I think that all people who use drugs are likely to commit crimes. I know that's not true, that's not true at all. I have only had students ask me specifically about relatives who do commit crimes against them and I wanted to know your answer. So just making sure you all know that that's not true, if you were thinking that's what I was implying. Anyway, Thank you so much, Angela, for coming from Mississippi to make that presentation. And also thank you, Sydney McCoy, for all the work that you did leading up to today. Thank you. And Sydney was the person who suggested that we bring Angela here, so this was all her idea. Awesome. And also very special thanks to Jim Baxter, who actually did all the work. The rest of us are just riding his coattails. Thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you, this was so valuable. If any of my students haven't signed the sheet in the back, please go do that. If anybody here hasn't signed the, the main library sheet, then please go do that. Otherwise, I'll see y'all later. Thanks for coming. <laughs>